How's it going everyone, Taki here. This is a different kind of video than I usually do on this channel, but I just got the new Retroid Pocket 2 Plus PCB in the mail, and I wanted to do a video on it. So let's talk about what we're gonna do here. I have one retail PCB, a set of buttons, some tools, a retail touchscreen, and a set of acrylic shells with the PCB battery adapter. Right now for devices, I have this purple shell that I made with custom analog stick covers. This uses dome switches, and even though they aren't as good as the new retail conductive rubber buttons, I can't get these gray buttons again, and I don't want to use white or black ones. I also have another black prototype shell with white buttons. This is a retail PCB with conductive rubber sample buttons used for verification purposes. I don't need to swap the PCB, but I can reuse the white buttons on this with the white conductive rubber button kit in another shell. After that, I'm going to turn the remaining PCB into a console with the acrylic case. So the first thing that we're going to do here is take a look at what we're working with with the PCB upgrade kit. We have a battery connector, some tweezers, a guitar pick, some directions, a Wi-Fi antenna, and some screws. Now let's do the teardown. At this point, you would remove four screws, but this one doesn't have any, so we're going to skip over to the next part, which is opening the case. Just get some leverage with the guitar pick and gently go around the perimeter to open up the case clips. I have three potential shells that I can work with. One is a grape shell that I'm already using, and I don't have a need for two of these at this point, so I'm going to save this one. This would leave me with a fire and a watermelon. Now we're going to be using white buttons, and I already know that they look decent on red, so I'm going to use the watermelon shell and put this to the side for now. Basically, everything from this needs to transfer over to here, and that means we're going to need to take off this battery and heat wrap to put onto this new case. We are going to start by getting this heat wrap off the back shell. Now that it's off, I am going to set this off to the side. Now we need to take off this battery, and there's no real good way to do this, so I'm just going to force it to come off. After some work, I managed to get the battery removed from the shell, and now I'm going to put it into the back of the red shell. It still has enough adhesive, so I'm going to press it down into place so it does not move. Then, I'm going to take the heat wrap and cover the battery. Here's what it looks like. Not perfect, but it's good enough. So the back is done now. The next thing that we're going to do is install the new touchscreen. I have the module right here. The one that is currently inside the black shell doesn't have a touchscreen, so I will not be reusing it inside this red case. This one also has a black border, so it'll look much better in this new case. To install the screen, you need to remove this film covering the adhesive. The edges can be a bit annoying to work with, so use the pry tool or your fingernail to rip them off. And we just have this, we're gonna lift that up. After the cover on the big E is removed, then I can install this into the front shell. Just slide it into place and press it down to secure it. Here's a look at our progress so far on this front shell. Here's our donor RP2. What do we really need from this? Well, we need our shoulder buttons, the two speakers, and the face buttons. Then we're going to take this old board and install it inside the acrylic case. To get this PCB out, we're going to start by removing the screws on the top right hand corner and continue by going clockwise around the perimeter. I still have one screw left to remove, but I'm going to take off the ribbon cable for the LCD screen with the white tweezers. And then I'm going to remove the ribbon cable for the white analog stick. I have the new buttons ready that I'm going to be swapping over with the new conductive rubber pads. I'm going to take these buttons and start installing them inside the front shell, starting out first with the ABXY tray and the D-pad. The rubber pads are easy to assemble by fitting them into place over the two posts. Now we're going to do the exact same thing with the D-pad. Now everything is good to go. Now that that's done, we need to put the home start and select tray under the screen. At this point, I should have installed the antenna cable, but I didn't, so we'll deal with that in just a moment. For now, I'm going to install the brand new PCB inside this shell. The most important thing here is to make sure that the LCD ribbon cable goes through the hole before you fully seat the PCB. I'm going to use those tweezers again to gently grab the analog ribbon cable that is still under the PCB. This new ribbon cable has not been bent yet, so I need to spend more time installing this than I would if I was using an old screen. I just need to roughly get this into the socket and then straighten it out with my tweezers. 
I'm going to do the exact same thing now with the analog stick, but I need to be more careful not to ruin this cable. Now we can start populating the stuff that we have here. First, let's take care of the speakers. To backtrack for the cable that I did not install when I was supposed to, I slid the PCB back and got the black strip into place inside the front shell. Then it's time to connect the antenna cable. Now we're almost finished and it's time to start installing the shoulder buttons and the remaining screws. I'm going to put in two screws for now so we can see if there are any issues with the conductive rubber buttons on the other side before we move on. Let's take a look at our work so far. I think this thing looks pretty nice and would probably also work well with black buttons if I had a set. Everything seems fine so we're going to keep on going. The only unfortunate thing about this build is that my R2 and L2 assembly uses purple plastic, but I don't mind for now. I can always change these again in the future if I want to. A pro tip when installing the shoulder buttons is to go counterclockwise until you feel the screw drop into place before fully tightening the screw. In the case of this watermelon shell, I need to create all of my own threads, so I don't need to worry about using this tip. Now that I'm done, I'm going to finish off by testing R1 and L1 to make sure that they do not have any obstructions. They're both fine, so we can fully finish off this build. Now let's boot up the device. Here's a look at the new user wizard that I haven't shown off before. I'm going to skip through this by pressing R1 to progress. I'm going to enable Google Play services and install some of the applications from the provided list. I can come back to this menu at any time, and these are the only ones that I need for right now. Now my device is good to go for future videos. I started filming this next section excited to talk about making a console out of the PCB kit that comes with the RP2 DIY upgrade. I think a lot of people have been sleeping on how good this hardware is for gaming at the price point of $65. For that money, you're getting a Cortex A75 CPU, which is much stronger than the types of Android TV boxes that you can buy for the same amount of money. At this point, there are no other good Android TV boxes that can compete with this, so I thought this was an exciting affordable home console opportunity, but I found one problem after building the entire kit. In their infinite wisdom, Retroid forgot to check or ensure that this self-contained DIY kit has the ability to work on the PCB that it comes with. Unfortunately, there is no way to get an HDMI signal out from this board without first installing a screen, which kind of defeats the purpose. I was able to get around this, but it's not as exciting. As you can see, I have an SD card inserted into the tray. This is a 256 gigabyte card filled with games. I've also gone ahead and installed a screen. This is gonna bump the total cost of making this into a home console to at least $80 unless you already have another screen. You can see that I've added passive heat sinks to this board. This is not really needed for this platform, but I use these in almost any build just so I can get rid of them. We're gonna be powering off a Type-C battery adapter and I've installed an antenna cable. We don't have access to input on this board besides the top three buttons and home start and select ones. So I'm gonna be pairing this up with a Bluetooth controller and HDMI out, leaving me with one free Type-C port that I can use for something like an external hard drive. Here's what the bottom currently looks like with my screen installed face down. Under the screen, I have some thermal pads and plastic to keep this from shorting out the board. I'm gonna wrap the back of this in black electrical tape as a permanent solution going forward, but this is good enough for now. Here's what the entire thing looks like once it's connected to a screen. The RP2 software comes with virtual mouse support, so you can do everything that you need to without needing to touch the screen at all, even if you're using a Bluetooth controller like I am now. I still need to spend some more time configuring this for optimal use. Right now, I can use this for PS2 game benchmarking or do screen captures for some of the videos that I'm about to release. Hopefully you enjoyed this look at the PCB kit and my process of making my custom Watermelon RP2+. Plus. There are a lot more videos on the way, so make sure to stay tuned to the channel. And if you're waiting for your device to ship, I hope you can get it before the end of the year. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk you out. The unfortunate thing is that the screen has to be here, so if I flip this over... Holy fuck.